Hello, welcome to this lecture, which is part of the Growth Astronomy School in Observational Techniques for Transient Studies. My name is Chris Copway. I'm from Liverpool John Moores University in the UK. Growth stands for the Global Relay of Observatories Watching Transients Happen, and we are an international team of astronomers who work together to explore the dynamic universe uninterrupted by daylight. So we use a network of observatories all around the world. We, uh, we operate in a way similar to a relay race. We pass the baton from one observatory to the next as the Earth rotates and daylight breaks in different locations, enabling us to react fast to interesting explosions that are reported by wide field discovery surveys. So being fast is just part of the process. The other one is to be able to look at cosmic objects at a range of different wavelengths to reveal different properties in physics. So the lectures and tutorials in this school will walk you through the various tools and techniques that will allow you to explore transients at all wavelengths. So today I'm going to be talking about photometry and this uh, lecture is uh, chiefly relevant to the ultraviolet, optical and infrared regimes. So my focus really is going to be on the optical but the techniques I describe are applicable to both ultraviolet and infrared as well, although there are some uh, additional sort of complications looking at those ends of the spectrum. Before I begin, I just want to show you this uh, telescope. This is the, uh, the Liverpool telescope, which is owned by my university. It's not in Liverpool. This is on the Canary Island of La Palma, uh, which is a wonderful observing site. It's one of the best observing sites in the world. This is a two meter fully robotic telescope. So it's entirely unmanned. We have no staff at the telescope, operating the telescope either during the day or the night. We operate the instrument entirely remotely from Liverpool. Uh, you can see in this image, uh, this, this lovely glamour shot, what a, a beautiful sky you have on a premier observing site like this. You can see the band of the Milky Way across the sky and these very many point sources, these individual stars around the sky. And that's what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the measurement of light from point sources in the sky, stars and star-like objects. So when it comes to astronomical data, we don't get those sort of pretty pictures like you saw on the previous uh, page. Uh, what we more usually see is an image something like this. So here is a, a region of a CCD with an astronomical image taken. And you can see we're sufficiently zoomed in. You can see the individual uh, pixels, the individual sort of uh, squares on the detector that make up the image. So uh, photons have struck my detector uh, and they've been translated into a, a signal, a, a measure of signal in each one of these pixels and the brightness of the pixel denotes that uh, intensity of that signal. So photometry is the measurement of integrated flux received from a celestial target by integrated flux, I mean the counts per unit time per unit area and this is as I say in the slide a fundamental measurement in astronomy. So how bright is this object? It's one of the most fundamental questions we can ask about anything we see in the night sky. So just to illustrate the uh, complications in something like this, I want to show you this image. This is a, a light curve uh, of some data I obtained on a four meter telescope in the Canary Islands um, some years back. So a light curve is a, a plot showing a time along the x-axis. In this case, it's in units of days. And then a measure of our brightness along the y-axis. Now, here are the data points. In this particular case, they are curved, but a light curve is not necessarily curved. But here we have a lovely curve. So this is made up of many individual data points. Uh, each exposure here was, I think, around about 10 seconds long, something like that. So there are very many points over the course of this time span. So if you look at the x-axis, you can see this ranges from 0.8 to 1.25 days. So this is about half a day's worth of data. So half a day I was observing for the entire night. Now there's a couple of things I want to talk about in this uh, plot. So first of all, if we look on the y-axis, I said this is our measure of brightness and the unit I have for brightness is uh, detector counts. So this is not a, a, a physical unit. It's not like um, um, joules or watts or something like that, which we might use to measure uh, brightness or energy. Um, what's happened here, so if we think about the process here, so there have been some photons that have been emitted by my object, which are reflected off my telescope mirrors, and eventually fallen on the surface of my detector. So my detector is a, a CCD, it's a, it's a silicon chip, a semiconductor. The uh, photons have hit that semiconductor, uh, some electrons have been uh, liberated, 
and eventually <coughs> uh, converted uh, into counts, you know, in, in an electronic sense in the detector. And this is what is, is giving me this sort of record. So this is not a, a, a physical unit in any sense. There's some sort of relationship between this number of counts and uh, photons, which is hidden in this plot. So that's the first thing I wanted to point out. So the second thing I wanted to talk about is the actual shape of the data here. So here we have uh, an object that is apparently uh, getting much brighter and then fading away over the course of the night. So if we look, it starts around about sort of 14,000 uh, counts, uh, and then it peaks around about sort of 22,000. So that is uh, more than 50% increase in brightness uh, by this measure of counts. Uh, it's also not completely smooth. You can see, uh, particularly in this region, there are these sudden sort of you know, this sort of variation, these kind of dropouts. It gets fainter and sort of varies around quite significantly. So, if you knew uh, nothing about astronomy at all, you might look at this and think, "Wow, this is this is some sort of highly variable object. It's getting uh, significantly brighter over the course of uh, a single night. It's varying. It's flickering all over the place. What is this object we're looking at?" Um, but uh, of course, if you recognise that we're standing on a planet with an atmosphere, uh, suddenly the shape of this becomes a lot clearer. So uh, let me illustrate this here. So I have a cartoon here. So uh, here, this uh, brown circle is my uh, cartoon representation of the Earth. And here is uh, me, uh, this face in the middle is me standing there with my telescope. Uh, and the blue is the atmosphere above me. So obviously none of this is the scale. So we have our star. So our star starts over here on the left hand side of the plot down on my horizon. And then over the course of the night, it rises and it transits, it passes above my head, it crosses my local meridian, and then it sets again. Okay. Now what this cartoon is trying to show you is that over the course of that observation, uh, there's a change uh, in terms of the amount of atmosphere, the photons, the starlight have to pass through to get to my detector. Okay, so uh, in this case, where it's low down on the horizon, in the first case where the star is over to the left of this image, it passes through a much uh, uh, a greater sort of path length through the atmosphere than it does when it's directly overhead. Okay, so you can sort of understand this in kind of cartoon form. Now, the Earth's atmosphere is not completely transparent to electromagnetic radiation. It um, absorbs and it, it uh, re-emits, it scatters light. Uh, with a lesser or greater efficiency at different wavelengths. Uh, and we know that, I can look out the window right now and I can see the sky is blue. So the atmosphere is certainly scattering the, uh, the blue of photons that are coming from the sun. Um, so this sort of absorbing and scattering effect is gonna be uh, greater in cases where the starlight has to pass through more mm -hmm. atmosphere. You can quite clearly see that if we have a star of constant brightness over the course of a night, as it's going to rise and transit and set again, I'm going to see a change in brightness. It's going to brighten and then decrease uh, from the point of view of me, the observer, uh, simply through the atmospheric absorption. And that's before I even consider uh, the effect of clouds moving in and out of my line of sight. So if this cloud here uh, moves across uh, the uh, line of sight between me and the star while I'm making my observation, again, it's going to absorb some photons and we're going to see some sort of effect from that. Um, and so that's what explains the shape of what's going on here. So this uh, star in actual fact is not very, very much at all, only very sort of tiny amount. And the entire sort of uh, dramatic increase um, in uh, brightness and then decrease later on is entirely due to the effect of the atmosphere as the uh, star uh, moves above my head and then the dropouts here these are these sort of yeah, drops every so often this is due to sort of little wispy parts of cloud that are passing over my head as I'm making the observation. <clears throat> Just as a point of interest uh, this particular uh, data set is an observation of an exoplanet it's an observation of a transiting exoplanet uh, WASP 12b so WASP 12 is the star WASP 12b is the planet that moves in line of sight between the star and the observer so as the planet moves uh, between the star and me with my telescope, it blocks out a small fraction of the starlight and I see a tiny little dip. Uh, and it is small, it's a fraction of a percent, but you can, if you, if you sort of uh, uh, look closely, you can see that this curve, there is a kind of a deviation from the curve in this region of the plot here. And that is actually the transit. So if I uh, perform the, uh, the kind of uh, techniques that I'm gonna demonstrate in this lecture and I subtract off the atmospheric effect, uh, this is what I see in this region of the plot. So here is our transit. So this is a, a comparatively tiny change in flux uh, over this part of the light curve. Okay, that's my planetary transit. This was in a paper we published in 2013.
So uh, what I'm just trying to illustrate in these uh, few slides here is that um, uh, there's, there is some uh, complication to these uh, methods of uh, transferring the, uh, the photons that we observe into something physical about the source we're looking at. We have to think of our observing system and account for our observing system. And by our observing system, I mean not only our telescope and our detector and our mirrors and all of that physical stuff, but also the atmosphere, the column of atmosphere, uh, upwards of our mirror to the top of the atmosphere. <clears throat> so we'll start very basically with some definitions. So luminosity. So when I talk about luminosity, I'm talking about the total power from a source of radiation, a star. Uh, units of luminosity are uh, power units, so energy per second, uh, something like that. Uh, watts is the SI unit. Uh, so luminosity is emitted in all directions over all wavelengths. And then we have flux. So flux is the luminosity, or energy per second, as we've just said, emitted per unit area of the source or detected per unit area by the observer. So there's two different types of flux there. There's the flux emitted per unit area and the flux detected per unit area. So I'm using a lowercase f for the emitted per unit area, area and an uppercase f for the detected per unit area. And this is overall wavelengths again. So this is in units of watts per square meter. Okay. So luminosity per unit area of watts per square meter will be the SI unit here. So the luminosity will be given by 4 pi r star, r star squared f. So uh, 4 pi r star squared is my star, which has a radius of r star. So the surface area of that star is 4 pi r star squared. So that's the surface area multiplied by f, which is the flux emitted per unit area of the source, gives me my luminosity. Okay, another way to formulate luminosity is in terms of uh, detection at a distance d. So I'm at a distance d, I'm the observer at a distance d from the star. Uh, so now the surface area we're talking about is 4 pi d squared. Uh, so there's a sphere of a uh, surface area of 4 pi d squared around our star. And the flux I'm detecting per unit area, this is the capital F flux. So L is 4 pi d squared where F is the flux detected per unit area. So I have these two formulations for luminosity. I can combine them together, I can make them equal to each other, I can cancel out those uh, four pi's, and I find D squared, capital F equals R star squared, lowercase f. And then I rearrange and I find F over F equals R star squared over D squared. So this is the inverse square law for radiation. Now in astronomy, we don't tend to use luminosity uh, or fluxes. Uh, in SI units, we tend to use a quantity called magnitude. So this is a, is, is a historic uh, sort of a conceit. So astronomy is the oldest of all the sciences. And so there are many elements of the subject, many uh, formalisms we use, which have their origins in antiquity. So the gentleman on the right of the screen here is Hipparchus of Nicaea. Uh, he is a Greek astronomer, and he originated something called the magnitude scale. So the magnitude scale was his method for uh, um, categorizing the brightness of stars. So the brightest stars he could see with his eye, he referred to as stars of the first magnitude. He went out there and he saw the brightest stars. He said, these are stars of the first magnitude. The faintest stars he could see, he referred to as stars of the sixth magnitude. And then all the rest were somewhere in between stars of the second magnitude, stars of the third magnitude, so on and so forth. And this was his system for establishing the brightnesses of stars. Now, the problem with this is the eye is in, in many ways a very unusual detector. It's, uh, it's an extremely uh, impressive detector in terms of dynamic range. It can see both extremely faint things and extremely bright things. Um, so what that, the, the reason is the eye has a very nonlinear response to light. Okay, so in actual fact, a sixth magnitude star is not six times fainter than a first magnitude star. It's more like a hundred times fainter. It's approximately a hundred times fainter. It's approximately a hundred times fainter, right? So there's a huge range in brightness. Okay, so, so what do we do with that? Well, as I say, it's approximately a hundred times fainter. With scientists, we don't really like approximately. Uh, so this was uh, formalized, the magnitude system was formalized by this guy. This is uh, the astronomer Norman Poxon, who lived in the 19th century. Uh, so in 1856, he formalized the magnitude system, as we said, 
the sixth magnitude star will be precisely 100 times fainter than a first magnitude star. So he fixed it mathematically. So what that means is each magnitude will correspond to a change in brightness of 100 to the power one fifth or 2.512. So if I have a first magnitude star, a second magnitude star will be 2.512 times fainter than that first magnitude star. The third magnitude star will be 2.512 times fainter than the second magnitude star, and so on and so on. So this is Pogson's equation. So we have fluxes here with our flux ratio, two stars, with fluxes F1 and F2. So the ratio of those F1 over F2 will be equal to 2.512 to the power of minus M1 minus M2, where M1 and M2 are the magnitudes of those two stars. The minus sign is in here because magnitudes are smaller for brighter stars. Remember, Hipparchos defined the first magnitude stars to be the brightest stars. So this is the uh, first sort of gotcha in this, uh, in this whole setup. So the smaller the number, the brighter the star. So if we take that Pogson's equation, we take the logarithm of both sides and do a bit of rearranging, we find that log to the base 10 F1 over F2 equals minus M1 minus M2, multiplied by log 10 of 2.512. So log 10 of 2.512, remember 2.512 was 100 to the power one fifth. So we see that the log to the base 10 of 2.512 is equal to 0 0.4. So we put that in and we rearrange again and we get M1 minus M2 equals minus 2.5 log 10 F1 over F2. So this is the magnitude equation and this is the fundamental equation behind what we're talking about here. On the right of this uh, uh, slide, I've got a figure showing you an image of a very famous constellation. So any uh, Northern Hemisphere observer should instantly recognize this constellation. This is Orion, of course. So there are the four stars at the, uh, the corners of the uh, Orion constellation, uh, Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel, and Safe. So again, remember the smaller the number, the brighter the star. So the brightest star out of these four is Rigel with a magnitude of 0.1, followed by Betelgeuse, and this one here is the faintest with a magnitude of 2.1. So the second thing to note is that uh, now that we have uh, formalized things, uh, we have dispensed with this uh, range of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 for magnitude. So we can have stars that are brighter than stars of the first magnitude, such as Betelgeuse and uh, Rigel here. Both of those are, are brighter than what you classify as a first magnitude star. You can go even brighter still, and then you would start heading down into negative numbers from really bright objects. You can also go below six. So again, with, with Harkov is talking about stars, you can see with his eye. So now we have telescopes, there are a great many stars, which uh, we can see that you can't see with your, naked, with your naked eye. And so their magnitude is gonna be greater than six, much greater than six in most cases. Now, when we're talking about flux so far, we've been talking about the total flux emitted by the object. So if we're talking total flux, then the associated magnitude is the total magnitude, or what we call the bolometric magnitude. Now, there's a problem with measuring total flux or total magnitude, bolometric magnitude, and the problem is, in order to measure that, in order to observe that, you need a, a bolometer. You need a detector that can detect flux at all wavelengths. And that's very, very hard. So stars emit electromagnetic radiation across a huge range of wavelengths. So it's very, very hard to build a detector that can detect EM radiation at both radio wavelengths and also at optical wavelengths, X-ray wavelengths. If you look at X-ray telescopes, optical telescopes, radio telescopes, they all look very, very different because they're observing EM radiation at very different uh, wavelengths, very different energies. So it's very, very hard to actually measure the bolometric magnitude, it's, it's impossible. So what we generally do is we measure flux over a finite band pass. So here I have a plot showing a black body, we have a flux density on the y-axis against wavelength along the x-axis. So let's say we want to measure the flux around about 550 nanometers. So 550 nanometers is a, a good sort of visual wavelength. It's you know, roughly in the middle of the eye's uh, visual range. This is light you would see with your eye. This is optical light, okay? So we call this the V-band magnitude, uh, where V here is, means visual. And we no normally denote that as either a capital V or uh, M 
subscript V. So the V band magnitude we get by measuring the V band flux. And what we do is uh, if we have this sort of black body, for example, we integrate the flux over a particular wavelength range and we call that our V band flux. Now there exists many photometric systems. What a photometric system is, is a series of band passes such as this uh, that are well defined and well understood with well characterized sensitivities. And from that we build what we call a photometric system. So an example, uh, a venerable example, one of the sort of uh, the most widely used systems in astrophysics is the Johnson Morgan Cousins set. So here we have a series of band passes. So they are uh, U, B, V, R, I, uh, or uh, ultraviolet, blue, uh, visible, uh, red, infrared. This is why the, the letters are as they are. So what we have a plot here is we have a plot shown on the y-axis at uh, transmission or you know efficiency you could say um, and then wavelength so the u-band for example detects uh, with a high efficiency around about uh, this uh, region so this is what sort of you know 0.1 to 0.2 microns and then the b-band and then the b-band as we said before around about sort of you know 550 nanometers and the r-band and the i-band as you go to longer wavelengths so these are our funny shapes uh, the shapes of these essentially are set by uh, the filters that you make to uh, make these detections. So here is an example of the types of filters and you would put one of these filters in your uh, light path and they would produce a transmission with these approximate shapes and these approximate band passes. So the, the shapes of these essentially depend on uh, the filters and how they're made and their composition, their transmission at different wavelengths. Here is a much more uh, modern uh, filter set. So this, uh, you might consider this to be the new standard. Uh, so these are extremely widely used. This was introduced in the 1990s for the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, uh, the FDSS uh, set, and it's in widespread use today. And you can see the advantages uh, from this plot. This is the same plot as before, transmission versus wavelength compared to the Johnson set. So uh, these are, are much sort of squarer compared to the Johnson ones. They're much more like sort of, you know, square top hat shape. So over their band path, over their wavelength range, uh, they're sort of, you know, much closer to flatter at the top. So they, they um, uh, have a higher transmission over a higher wavelength range. They don't overlap there. They're nice separate and distinct from each other. Uh, and they have a broader bandwidth. So they let in more light, essentially. So these are, these are great. These are improvements in, in every possible way over the previous set uh, for doing astronomy. Um, and again, the reason why uh, we would use this now instead of the Johnson's, the reason why we can use this now is because of advancements in the, uh, the, the materials properties of how we sort of make filters and coat filters and so on. You can make a much better uh, optic these days than you were able to when the Johnson set was conceived. Here's an example of them in operation. So this is a close-up of part of the Liverpool telescope. So these little screw holes, these silver screw holes, normally there would be a camera mounted here. There'll be an optical camera mounted here. Uh, and on the other side of this is the mirror uh, where the light is coming in uh, from the telescope. So the photons from the star are coming in and they're passing through this filter where they would be hitting the camera if the camera was here. So the camera's been removed so you can see the filter wheel. So this section here is just one part of what is a, a, a large wheel with many filters in, and the whole wheel rotates to put a different filter uh, in, the, um, in, the, um, in the image plane. You see, so uh, we have one filter here, one filter here, one filter there, and many more around the ring, which you can't see. The filter wheel rotates to select your particular filter for your particular observation. And the photons from the star pass through the filter and hit your detector. Now the filters we discussed so far are considered to be broadband, and by broadband we generally mean uh, pass bands greater than around sort of 30 nanometers or so. There also exist uh, intermediate band filters with pass bands of around about sort of 10 to 30, and there are narrow band filters as well. So these are filters with pass bands of less than 10 nanometers. So why would you use something like that? Because a smaller pass band means it's going to let uh, much less, uh, much uh, a much fewer number of uh, photons through compared to a broadband. Or maybe you want to isolate something particular. So, for example, you might use a narrowband filter that is around a particular spectral line, a particular atomic transition um, that you might want to observe. So, here is an example. This is an H alpha filter. So, H alpha filter, this is the hydrogen alpha line, which is uh, around about here, uh, um, uh, 65, uh, 650 nanometers approximately. Uh, 
Um, so this uh, filter is six nanometers wide and it purely isolates that line. So you can measure any sort of change in that particular line, and not have to worry about contributions from the light, uh, redwoods and bluewoods of that line. Okay, so uh, the calibration of stellar magnitude. So recall our magnitude equation, M1 minus M2 equals minus 2.5 log 10 F1 over F2, where F1 and F2 are our measured fluxes. Now, the key point here is that F1 over F2 uh, is uh, one flux divided by another flux. This is a dimensionless quantity, okay? So this doesn't have to be in a, a watt or something like this. I can measure this in something like detector counts, okay? So any kind of uh, efficiencies in this process or inefficiencies in terms of uh, transforming uh, photons into electrons into counts, they're just gonna cancel out the top and the bottom because the same factors will apply both at the top and the bottom. So if I use my optical system for two different stars, uh, I can use my uh, detector counts here, my sort of unphysical measure without any problem at all to detain the difference in magnitudes. Okay, so the way I would do this is I would take my astronomical image and here I have my uh, image of my star inside a software package. I've drawn an aperture, a circle around my star, and I'm gonna count up all of the counts in each one of these pixels. So I'm gonna add up everything in that one, and 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 that one so on and so forth. And I'm gonna get a number for the flux from that particular star. I'm gonna do that for a star number one, and a star number two, and from that, I'm going to determine the difference in their magnitudes, M1 minus M2. Now, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that, uh, because what you have to consider is that in this aperture, you haven't just got counts from your star, you also have counts from your sky background. So you can actually see in the image, the background here, the bit where there isn't a star isn't perfectly black. There are photons in that part of the image as well. So those photons have multiple origins. Uh, there is, for example, a lot of uh, scattered light in the sky from the moon on a, on a bright night, on a night when the moon is full. There is contributions from, example, unresolved background stars. There's contributions from uh, zodiacal light within the solar system. But the, uh, the empty sky is not perfectly devoid of photons. And this becomes particularly true when you go to infrared wavelengths. So how do I deal with this? Well, what I do is I also define an area of sky. So here I have an annulus defined by these yellow circles with an inner radius and an outer radius. And in here, I can look at these sky photons um, and I can work out the number of uh, uh, photons, number of counts per pixel, okay? And if I assume that the sky uh, background level in this region is the same in this annulus as it is in my aperture, if I've worked out the sky background level per pixel, I can then work out the number of pixels in my inner aperture and then subtract off the sky contribution to end up with the contribution from my star alone. Okay, that's the theory. Now, as I said, the relative magnitudes are given by M1 minus M2 equals minus 2.5 log 10 F1 over F2, the difference in magnitude between two stars. Now, consider if one of my stars has a magnitude of zero. So, uh, star two here uh, has a magnitude of zero. So M2 equals zero. And F2 is the flux of a zeroth magnitude star. So if I do that, then this equation changes. So this one, M equals minus 2.5 log 10 F over F0, where F0 is the flux of my zeroth magnitude star. And this is the equation for apparent magnitude. So the magnitude I would derive from my star with flux F, in this case, uh, we would call it apparent magnitude. It's like it's, uh, it's observed as magnitude. So F0, as I said, is a flux from a zero magnitude star. Traditionally, for our zero magnitude star, we use Vega. So Vega is a bright star uh, visible in the sky. So here is an image of Vega, very bright object. Here is its constellation, uh, uh, the Lyre. So Vega is Alpha Lyrae, it's the brightest star in that particular constellation. And what we say is we say by definition that Vega has a magnitude of zero. And this is the primary standard that we hang our photometric system on. It has a magnitude of zero in every wave band. So it has a B band magnitude of zero, it has a B band magnitude of zero, it has an R band magnitude of zero, it has a Sloan G magnitude of zero by definition. So we can take our equation and we can rearrange it. We can actually extract this using our, our log rules. So uh, we find that M is equal to minus 2.5 log 10 F plus Z. 
and z here is a quantity we call the zero point, and minus 2.5 log 10f is what we call the instrumental magnitude. Now the point here is I've lost my uh, convenience of this being a dimensionless flux ratio when I separated them out. So I have two quantities here that are uh, intrinsic essentially to my instrument, my detector, okay? So the instrumental magnitude that I measure with my telescope will be different to the instrumental magnitude we measured on a different telescope, even if we we're observing the same star. Okay, that's why we call it the instrumental magnitude. So we have this equation relating what we're going to call the true absolute magnitude. So this is the absolute magnitude that we would measure on any telescope to the instrumental magnitude and the zero point. And these instrumental magnitude and zero point are intrinsic to my optical system. Okay, so this is going to be true. Providing that m inst and z are measured with the same instrument but in the same way. I can't measure z for one telescope and m inst for a different telescope and hope to get a reasonable number for the absolute magnitude out at the end. For so these particular numbers, are going to be unique to my optical system. Optical system depends on my telescope, uh, my mirror, so it's going to be affected by efficiencies. So, how clean is my mirror on my telescope? Is it dusty? Uh, there's going to be various sort of optics and lenses, you know, what's the transmission of those lenses, how many photons are lost along the way, the detector, how efficient is my detector at converting uh, photons into electrons, uh, the filter I'm using, and the atmosphere, so this column of atmosphere. So now we get to this point that I started out in the lecture, where we're going to measure a different flux, a different number of detector counts, depending on where the star is in the sky. So how do we uh, how do you do our calibration? Well, uh, essentially, what we need to use is something called a standard star. So a standard star is a star of a known magnitude. So let's say I have a, a book with a list of stars with known magnitudes. These are known apparent magnitudes. So I take my optical system and I measure the flux of that star. So I, have, I know M standard. I observe with my telescope and I measure F standard by pointing my telescope and collecting photons and then counting the photons in the aperture. So if I know M and I measure F, I can calculate Z. I can calculate the zero point based on those two. And once I know Z, once I know the zero point, I'm at the races. So I now can look at a star that I don't know anything about. And again, I measure the flux, I point my telescope, I collect photons, I count the counts in the aperture. So I know this. I measure this and I can calculate its magnitude m. So I can work out the apparent magnitude of my new star, my previously unknown star. So it's a two step process. I observe my standard and I know the magnitude of that one. I get the flux and that gives me z. And now I know z and the flux of a different star that gets me the magnitude. <coughs> Excuse me. So just as an aside, I talked about Vega as the absolute reference star. However, we do know that Vega does actually vary slightly. Uh, but all stars vary to some degree if you look at them uh, closely enough. Um, so uh, a more modern uh, system rather than the, the Vega magnitude system is the AB magnitude system. And this is commonly used today. So this is based on absolute units rather than with respect to any one star. So this is based on flux measurements. So uh, the AB magnitude uh, is equal to minus 2.5 log uh, flux divided by 3631 Jamskis. So in other words, a zero magnitude star, for this to be a zero uh, magnitude, uh, the flux will be 3631 Jamskis. So a Jamski is a strange unit. It has its origins in radio astronomy, and one Jamski is equal to 10 to the minus 26 watts per hertz per square meter. Uh, but this is an alternative uh, system to Vega magnitudes, which you will very likely see in your career. Now, before that slide, before that slide, I was talking about standard stars. So here's an example of a standard star catalog. This is a, uh, a copy of a section of a catalog, the Landau catalog, which I obtained from the website of the European Southern Observatory. So we have here a list of stars. Uh, these are known and well understood standard stars. They've got very exciting names, as you can see, F11, F16. Uh, they have coordinates on the sky, right ascensions and declinations, and they have V-band magnitudes here. So, for example, F11 has a V-band magnitude of 
Uh, we also have these numbers, which are the, uh, the color indexes of this particular star. Now, color index for reasons of time, it's not something I'm really going to cover in this lecture. Uh, but essentially, when we combine two magnitudes like this, this gives us what we call a color index. So uh, it works by simple math. So if I want to know the B band magnitude, uh, then I would add V to B minus V. So V plus B minus V equals B. So 12.07 minus 0 0.24 will give me my B band magnitude and so on. And I can work out all of the other magnitudes in a similar way. So this is just the way it's been there shown in this particular table. Now, that's all good, that's all fine. The complication is I've talked about the atmosphere being part of my optical system, okay? So the zero point is gonna depend on my optical system, depending on the atmosphere. So again, we go back to that plot I showed you right at the beginning. The star rises and sets, and the flux I'm gonna measure is gonna vary. So my zero point will also vary with the altitude of the star, how high the star is above the horizon. Uh, which we also call the air mass of the star, so the mass of air the photons have to pass through. So that's a problem. Uh, problem number two is it's also going to vary from night to night because everywhere on the Earth has weather. The atmosphere can get uh, sort of you know sort of dustier or you know more cloud on different nights. So the transmission of the atmosphere is going to change to some degree from night to night, even on the same site. Okay. So this is a problem because if I want to observe my target star, my standard star, in two different parts of the sky, then the air mass, the altitude of those two stars, is going to be different. So I'm not comparing like with like. So how do I resolve this? Well, I can resolve this by observing my standard on multiple occasions. Okay, so at different air masses. And then what I will find is I will find the different measurements. I get a different flux each time. But basically from those different measurements of flux, I can infer the extinction uh, of the atmosphere on that particular night. So this is the, uh, the, the magnitudes that are being lost per unit air mass. So essentially I would plot uh, magnitude versus air mass for my observations. And I can work out the extinction in magnitudes per air mass. And then I can apply a correction to my science target based on that uh, for whatever air mass I observe my science target at. Okay, so that's a little bit complicated, but it's an extra step you have to do. Um, cloud is going to be a problem. So if I make my multiple observes, observations of my standard star uh, and the uh, cloud cover is changing from one observation to the next, then there's going to be a, an absorption uh, based on the amount of cloud cover in each one of those observations, and that's going to throw my observations off. So that's not good. So I would ideally choose what we call a photometric night. So a photometric night would be a night where there is no cloud at all. Okay, I say choose. We don't, as astronomers, have the luxury of choosing the conditions we observe in. When we go up to the telescope, we get what we're given. But ideally, we'd make our observations in photometric conditions. So this is an initial complication we have to deal with. Happily, in the modern era, we have a solution to this problem, because we're now in the era of wide field surveys. So what that means is huge areas of the sky have been observed by such surveys, and we have well-calibrated stars with well-understood magnitudes all over the sky. So what that means is when I take my science exposure, when I take my image of my science target on the sky, as well as my science target, there's almost certainly going to be a number of stars in that image which have a very well understood magnitude, and I can treat them as standard stars, okay? And that's great because if I'm taking my standard star and my, my effective standard star and my science target in the same exposure, those are going to be the same air mass, there's going to be the same transparency essentially, so all these things are going to cancel out. Now, there are many surveys available. They vary by footprint and filter set. I'm just gonna talk about one or two just to give you a flavor, but there are, there are more than these. Uh, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this is a popular one because of course this uses the Sloan filter set, which so many other telescopes use these days. Um, so here it is, uh, it uses the UGRIZ Sloan filters, obviously. It has a rather limited footprint. So the shaded regions of the sky here, the, the bits colored in black, these are the regions of the sky that have been observed by Sloan. So if your target, your science target, is in one of these regions, uh, happy days. There's likely going to be a number of stars in your science image <coughs> uh, that are also in the Sloan survey. If it's in one of these white regions, you're out of luck and you have to use a different survey for your calibration. Pan stars, uh, PS1 survey, is another excellent survey. So this one observed the entire northern hemisphere. So you can see this lovely image here. Uh, this is a, you know, a combination of many, many pan stars images all stitched together. And you can see the plane of the galaxy in this image, beautiful. So the entire northern hemisphere 
uh, the filter set is GRIZ and also Y, which is an additional redder filter than those used by Flow. Uh, and two masses this is a very different one. So here we have an all sky image, so two masses observe the entire sky. We can see the plane of the galaxy in the middle here. It's an infrared survey. So if you want to do infrared astronomy, uh, this is the type of survey that you would need to use. Uh, the problem is it's relatively shallow, so it's only picking up really bright stuff. Now, right, so let's talk about photometry. Right at the top of this lecture, I define photometry as the measurement of integrated flux received from a celestial target where integrated flux is the counts per unit time per unit area. There are different techniques for measuring this integrated flux. Uh, the technique I've introduced so far is called aperture photometry. We're also going to discuss in this lecture point spread function PSF photometry. These techniques are useful if you're looking at point sources like stars. If you're talking about an extended source, like a, a galaxy, for example, uh, you have to do a different technique, you have to use a different technique, such as surface photometry. But this is a uh, transient lecture in a time domain course, so I'm considering the photometry extended sources to be out of scope for this lecture. So aperture photometry. So I've defined this before. It's about the measurement of flux within an aperture. Our aperture is typically, but not necessarily circular. There's no reason why it has to be circular. Uh, we typically use circular apertures because the stars we're looking at on the sky appear to be circular. We measure, as I discussed, the sky flux from a surrounding annulus. So here I have an image. Again, this is an image on the sky. The red circle here is my aperture around my star, and the yellow circles are the inner and outer annulus of my sky annulus. And we're choosing a region of sky around about my target under the assumption that the brightness of the sky in this region is the same as the brightness of the sky under my star, or the brightness of the sky would have if the star was to be removed. When I'm doing this, I have my target star and my comparison star, my standard star. I would use the same aperture to measure flux from the standard star for calibration as I do for my target. I would not use a bigger aperture or a smaller aperture, one or the other, because that's going to cause problems, as you will see. You can also compute the total flux from the curve of growth, which is something I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides' time. So what are we measuring here? As I said, we're counting up all of the flux in all of these pixels. So it's the sum of the object flux plus the sky flux within this region. And I'm subtracting away from that n multiplied by b, where n is the number of pixels in the aperture and b is my sky background per pixel. So I work out the sky background per pixel using my outer annulus. I multiply that by the number of pixels within the aperture, and that subtracts away the sky component from the signal in principle. How big an aperture should I use? Now the aim here is to maximize the signal to noise ratio, essentially the, 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 the significance of the detection, uh, minimizing the error bar on my measurement. So the signal comes from the target, the target counts, uh, and the noise, the noise contribution comes from multiple places, including sky counts. So you may have seen this equation before, this is the famous array equation for CCD astrophysics. So the signal to noise ratio is given by my uh, uh, source signal multiplied by time, exposure time, divided by the square root of the various noise components here. So uh, there is a noise component for my object itself. This is the Poisson noise, the shock noise from the detection itself. I have a noise component from the sky. And then these two are the dark current and the readout noise. These are noise sources in my detector itself. So we would be ideally be in a situation if we have an expensive astronomy grade detector where these quantities are very, very small. So the uh, noise essentially is determined by the object photons and the sky photons. This is what we call the, uh, the, the background limited regime. So what size aperture? Well, you can sort of eyeball it and see what's about right. Okay, uh, It's clear that what is about right is something that's going to get most of the flux from the target and minimize the contribution from the sky. So in this case, the aperture is clearly too small. So we're going to lose target signal here. If we add up all of the uh, photons from the target inside this circle, there's a lot of signal from the target that I'm throwing away. So that's not good. It's minimizing the signal in my signal to noise equation. Here, the aperture is clearly too big. So um, 
it's too big. I've got all of my uh, photons from my target, which is good, but I'm also adding in an awful lot from the sky. Now I can work out the number of sky uh, uh, pick, uh, photons that are contributing and subtract them off as I do, um, but I can't subtract away the noise. Okay, so there's gonna be an increase in noise from all of this background contribution, and that's not good. So in this case, my signal goes down, and in this case, my noise goes up, and in both cases, my signal to noise ratio is gonna be suboptimal. So what is the best? Well, I mean, the way to find it out analytically would be to actually reduce your data over and over again uh, by using apertures of different sizes. You increase it, get it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and compute the signal to noise ratio in each of those cases and find out which one is best. So that's uh, how you would do it from first principles. In practice, what we find is the optimum aperture size, the best aperture size, is around about the same as the full width half maximum of our source. So uh, we have a point spread function here, the full width half maximum uh, is around about the aperture optimum aperture size. So what that means it depends on our optical system. So the size of the object here, the full width half maximum, uh, is gonna depend on uh, our optics, uh, the diffraction in the telescope optics. It's also gonna depend uh, on the sight seeing, so the turbulence in the atmosphere where our telescope is based. So that will determine the full width half maximum. So basically our optimum aperture size is gonna vary with telescope, with location, and also from night to night as sky conditions change. Now we can choose an optimum aperture size, but that doesn't get the total flux. So some light is always gonna be scattered to extremely large radii. So the question is, you know, how important is that? And in some cases it's potentially quite important. So here we have two sort of profiles. So what I have in the plot here is I have along the y axis, I have counts, and then x axis pixels from the center of the profile. So here is the very middle of the star, and we're getting further and further away from the star, star sorry. And as we go further and further away, we're measuring the number of counts in that particular pixel. So the white dots here are the data points, and the red line is a, is a fit to that data, which is you know, okay. It's not very good right in the middle, but it's a, it's a good enough start. So this is a quite a bright star. So the background level, the sky brightness level is around about somewhere down here at the bottom of this plot. So this is a very bright star, we're detecting it quite clearly. So where would we set the outer edge of our aperture in terms of pixels? Well, if we set it sort of around about here, around about 10 pixels, we're pretty confident that we've got pretty much uh, all of the photons from that particular star, okay? We can be fairly confident about that because we're right down in the background noise here, we're right down in the weeds. Let's look at this fainter star. So here we have a, it's a clear detection of a star. There is something here. You can see that the, uh, the curve fits up there nicely. Um, but now the question of where you put the outer edge of your aperture is somewhat less clear because you can see there is a, a noise here. This is the noise in the background, the sky noise is up and down. So at what point are we uh, throwing away target photons in terms of placing our aperture? That's not completely clear, okay? so. What you can apply is something called a curve of growth correction to uh, essentially correct your aperture which you chose to give you an infinite sized aperture. Um, and I'm not gonna say any more about that right now because it's something we're gonna look at in the workshop associated with this lecture. I said before that we would ideally use the same phone aperture for our target and standard star. This is not necessarily optimal in the common case when the standard is much brighter than the target. So if we consider in this image that this star in the top left hand corner was our target and this was the star we used in comparison. You can see that uh, the kind of the optimum aperture you use for either one of these uh, is going to be different. Okay, so we can potentially use different size apertures but we must be sure to apply an aperture correction, a scaling factor to account for the difference between the two. So that's something that can be done to kind of try and optimize the situation here. And that's aperture photometry. It's a relatively simple technique. I've, I've kind of sort of trivialized it by talking about circle and then you count up all of the photons in size, but it's not really any more complicated than that. There are some complications. What size aperture do you use? And we made some assumptions. So I've talked about uh, measuring the background from the angular surround. So we're assuming when we do that, that we have a linearly varying background, okay? So if we have a fairly complicated background, one that's quite sort of, you know, sort of lumpy and variable in unpredictable ways on short time scales, uh, then that's not going to give an optimum result. Um, but these are minor complications. Okay, Generally, the technique of aperture photometry works very well on isolated stars. The problem is, how do you deal with crowded fields such as this one? So look at this. This is an amazing image. You know, lots of stars, 
different brightnesses, different colors, uh, you know, fantastic stuff. And how on earth do you go about drawing an aperture around one of the stars in an image like this and being confident that you have got all of the photons from that particular star in your aperture and you don't have any photons coming from any of the neighboring stars? Um, and the answer is you can't. That's, that's impossible, essentially, on a field such as this one. Um, and, you know, what region of this plot would you consider to be your background, right? Okay, that's quite challenging. So uh, how do you deal with this? And the answer is you use a technique called PSF photometry. So I'm going to introduce PSF photometry here, and it's something we're going to look at in much more detail in the workshop. So when I say PSF, I mean point spread function. So a star is a point source. If we had a perfect detector, we would observe an infinitely small sort of point on the sky. We don't actually observe that. We observe the light sort of spread out over a region of our detector. Uh, and this is due to uh, a number of effects. So it's due to uh, diffraction through the aperture of our telescope. So this is going to be a lesser or greater effect depending on how big our telescope is. Uh, it depends very largely on atmospheric seeing. So the reason we place telescopes in one or two locations around the world, big expensive telescopes, is because the seeing, the turbulence in the atmosphere is smallest in those locations. So that minimizes the size of the point spread function. OK, so you have this point spread function for all point sources. So here's an example. This is a kind of a 3D representation of what we have. We have our sort of point source in the middle. What we actually image on our imaging plane is something like this. OK, the light spread around the central point. I've already showed you this, this sort of sort of 1D representation where we have counts versus pixels from center. And you can see here the profile here with the white points being the data points and the blue line here being the model fit. So the point spread function is describing the response of the imaging system. So again, when I talk about imaging system, I'm talking about both telescope, detector, and atmosphere. Um, the response of that system to a point source. Now, when we uh, approximate astronomical PSS, we typically use uh, Gaussian functions or uh, Moffat functions. So you'll be familiar with Gaussians, I'm sure. Uh, Moffat function might be less familiar to you, but they look quite similar. So here's a plot here showing the two. You can see they're, they're, they're more or less uh, they're comparable, okay? So these generally are good approximation to astronomical PSFs, and you can see the other uh, functional form of them over on this side of the plot. <coughs> Excuse me. So how does PSF photometry work? So basically, the technique is thus. We use a large number of stars, like in our image I showed you before, and we create a model, the point spread function, in the image. Okay, so uh, we have uh, functions here with many parameters. And then we will modify those parameters to best fit the data. We can subtract this model from the data and see how, how uh, could we do. We, we, we're following a sort of minimization technique. And then we refine the model, we refine the parameters in our Gaussian function or our Moffat function to minimize the residuals. So we can do this iteratively, iteratively to improve the results. And over time, we will get an excellent fit to hope, hopefully get an excellent fit to all of the PSS within our image. And then once we know that, once we clearly understand the PSS of our individual stars, we can clearly characterize the uh, distribution of photons from each source in that image. So we can make this distinction of where the photons are coming from. Are they coming from our target star or are they being scattered from some nearby star? And that's it. So I'm not going to say any more than that because you're actually going to apply this technique in the workshop. Now, there are some problems here. So problem number one is maybe your PSF are a little bit more complicated and you can't describe them very well with the parametric profiles, right? So your model is not a good fit to the data. So that's a complication one. Complication number two is your PSF might not necessarily be constant across your detector. So this is particularly the case uh, with wide field optics. It's true of really all optical system that you will find uh, degradation in image quality as you move away from the optical axis in the middle to the outside of the detector. So you commonly see this, you see like sort of, you know, elongated PSS, you know, sort of uh, ellipsoid shaped stars, uh, you know, sort of coma and these type of optical aberrations and stigmatism and so on at the edges of your detector. So it's particularly true for wide fields and cheaper optics. So uh, that could be a problem because uh, your model then is going to struggle to cope with the fact that the PSF is going to be different at different parts of the detector. So you're going to need to eliminate some of the stars in the field from the model fit. So there are complications here, but ultimately it's a technique that is extremely powerful for looking at these crowded fields. <laughs>
And that's all I've got to say. So I'm briefly going to summarize uh, what I've talked about in this lecture. So I talked about initially about luminosity and flux, the definitions of those two. I introduced the magnitude system, the history of the magnitude system and why we use it. And I've talked about apparent magnitudes. Now, if you're familiar with the apparent the, the magnitude system, you'll be aware that I've not discussed absolute magnitudes. So absolute magnitudes, this is a magnitude measurement we can make when we know the distance to our object. Uh, and then we can understand um, what we're talking about in terms of the kind of, you know, the, real, the true sort of energy and the physics of what's going on in that particular star. So the apparent magnitude is like the observer's magnitude. So if you consider the uh, flux I detect from my star, uh, as we saw in the first few slides, is going to depend on two things. It's going to depend on uh, the amount of photons that are being emitted by that star and also how far away it is, okay, because of our friend the inverse square law. So that's the apparent magnitude, the observer's magnitude. If I know the distance, I can account for that. And that's when we start talking about absolute magnitudes, but for reasons of time, i have not talked about absolute magnitude in this lecture. We talked about band passes and filters and some of the common filter sets, uh, the Johnson set, the Sloan set that are in use today. And we talked about calibration. We had these concepts of zero point and instrumental magnitude. Then we talked about standard stars and how you get standard stars, how you can look them up in the catalog. Uh, or you could use your survey and find your standard stars within your field. We talked about the technique of aperture photometry and how you'd apply it and some of the complications associated. And we introduced PSF photometry and also the complications that are involved there. Um, and that takes me to the end of my lecture. So thank you very much for your attention. For those of you who are signed up to the uh, growth summer school this year, I uh, look forward to seeing some of you uh, later on in the live session. For those of you who are not signed up uh, or uh, are re watching this lecture at some later date, I should say that all of our materials in the summer school are available at this URL. So from here, you'll be able to download not just this lecture and all the other lectures, but also all the materials that we are using in the live practical sessions. Uh, so I shall finish there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.